Welcome everybody to Fossil Club. It's time to go to West Virginia, but not West Virginia that we know today. West Virginia from the Devonian period. Mason, would you introduce our wonderful presenters for this evening? So today we are extremely lucky to have two professors from West Virginia University, Potomac State, and they'll introduce themselves, but I'll tell you that uh, Nick Gardner is a library scientist and is always doing all sorts of things from all across the natural world, always doing research. Uh, he's a real naturalist like all of us. Um, and then we also have Nathan uh, Van Rankin, uh, Professor Nathan Van Rankin, who's a geology professor, and he studies uh, mosasaurs, uh, but he's also been branching out into other things. He came to us from Texas, and he's been working here for a few years now. Uh, so without further ado, I'll leave it to them to present. Uh, and thank you so much for being here, guys. Sorry about that. I had a little bit of a fumble there while trying to get to the unmute. Uh, as Nate can attest, we are been transitioning back to working on site, so I did not realize uh, I had taken my webcam back to work. Um, however, I've got a mic, so it's all good. And Nate is always ready to broadcast from the Moza Lair in his basement. Yep. So, uh, so I am Nick Gardner. I'm a librarian at uh, Potomac State College. We're in Little Kaiser, West Virginia. If you ever get over to Cumberland, uh, Maryland, out our way, we so encourage you, please come visit. Our little town is really kind of revitalizing itself. We have lovely little coffee shops and eateries and all that cool stuff, a little thrift shop air, or a little thrift shop district rather. Um, come check us out. We are a growing part of the region. Uh, again, I am Nick Gardner. I'm a librarian with Potomac State. Uh, typically, I am involved in library instruction. We may wear a lot of different hats, but when I am off the clock or in my downtime, I like to you know, keep myself kind of engrossed in different research activities because I feel like it helps keep me sharp for when I'm working with students and helping one of them with their own research pro uh, projects. Uh, I'm a, a Northern Virginia native, but West Virginia is sort of my adopted home. Uh, most of my family is from here. Um, so now I'll let uh, the gentleman that we've kidnapped from t uh, Texas introduce himself. We're very happy to have had him for the past three years here at Potomac State. And I'm very happy to have played a role in uh, encouraging him to pick up his sticks from the, you know, South. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nathan or Nate Van Franken, and I am a professor at Potomac State College. I'm part of the STEM division, and I teach classes such as entry level geology and geography with a focus on human geography and world regional and landform geography. Um, and I'm really great, uh, really enjoying it here in West Virginia. Originally, I'm from Texas and have now officially branched out and started to learn about stuff that my rocks sit on top of. Yeah, um, so the way that we're going to do this is as the West Virginia native, I'm going to kind of guide us along and then leave and then leave space for Nate to expand upon some of the stuff that he's doing within this area. I'm happy to have finally like convinced him that West Virginia Paleo is really cool too. Uh, although he works on some really neat things that he might mention later, or maybe he'll get a chance to come back and talk more about. But this kind of starts off with, as all research projects do, with the problem. So we're in Mineral County, and that is one of the more eastern counties of the state. We're in the Potomac Highlands region. And Kaiser is kind of uniquely situated in the middle of the county, uh, but we're very close over the border. And a lot of the sites that we're talking about are only accessible because the uh, road cut space, or sorry, because the road cuts through it. And actually that's been one of the ongoing problems with West Virginia geology is that when a lot of the early surveying was done across the Eastern seaboard from the 1800s, um, the lack of accessible and easily path, uh, pathing roads really made it more difficult. There was a, a big kind of revisit into this in the early 1900s after people had begun to explore again the paths carved out by the railroad lines. Um, but by and large, it's so interesting to me to pick up the county reports from the Geological Survey of the state and 
how they actually tell us a good bit about what was happening economically just because of the, the lack of access that was had for these different areas. All right. So when you one of the ways I, I love how this is put in one of the county reports, they actually describe that the upper Devonian and into Carboniferous rocks have been eroded away leaving the largely incompetent, yes, that is how they word it, largely incompetent strata of the Devonian and lower measures in which lateral thrust has produced severe folding. And this is, of course, our county, as you can see right here. And notice how it almost looks like the geologic map is almost looks like rainbow vomit. That is because literally that is how folded with synclines and anticlines this entire region is. So it truly has been a real challenge. And of course, this area is of a low economic value for geology, so there had not been much interest in pursuing more with it. Um, again, just underscoring the point of what they mean when they say largely incompetent, this is a, a very generalized cross-section of the region. Um, so you can see here the Silurian Tuscarora is sticking up through here, and the Pocono here is the bottom of the Mississippian. And honestly, the way they've shown this high plateau is a little too smooth. It's actually like super wrinkly. And this is actually out at one of our sites. It shows a great example how we almost have like a reverse S in how curved it is. And I love this to point out to people whenever people ask, what is a fold? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, just basically showing again how the stuff as things have been moving laterally have become more compressed and distorting the way things look. Uh, so this is actually on Route 46 or Fort Ashby Road. Uh, this is I pulled this from Google Photos because this site is so big, it's hard to get a good picture of it because it's you're crammed between two uh, high mountain ridges on either side. And what you notice is, I, I hope you guys can see, can you all see my mouse when I go over? Okay. The, ori the fold basically follows this path where it, on the left it starts to curve up. Then it comes back down. Then it swings back up at almost 90 degrees. And then squishes back down here. And then there's just this series of like really tight little folds through here. Um, so yeah, that is how messed up West Virginia geology is. Especially in the Devonian. Alright. Um, this was actually further compounded by the fact that when the early USGS guys came in and out to survey the area, unfortunately, they didn't try. So this was actually after Hall or James Hall had done a lot of fantastic work in New York and uh, and other people had followed suit in Pennsylvania of doing really well to clarify the stratigraphy and clarify the geologic column of that area. Um, unfortunately, when they came down to our end, they kind of gave everything their own little names. And I see White, who was the head geologist, actually explicitly called them out on that and said, we are not going to follow what the USGS, and actually these guys were acting on behalf of the Maryland Geological Survey at the time. Uh, if you open the Lower Devonian Handbook or the Upper Devonian Handbook uh, for your counties, there's actually a good bit of information for our county in there as well. Um, so we basically started to try to actually correlate with what had been done by Hall. Uh, this is an example so you can see like how it looks in the Maryland Geological Survey. So we have a lot of regional names for things, such as someone mentioned they've been out to Romney. So we have the Romney Shale. We have the Jennings Sandstone, uh, et cetera. The only thing that looks consistent to this day and age is the Arisky and, Hel uh, Arisky and Helderberg. And that's because those were largely uh, formations that were present um, up through Pennsylvania and New York. The one thing I appreciate about this is that they refer to the uppermost unit as the Catskill Red uh, Sandstone Formation. Uh, so making it very clear it was correlated with Pennsylvania and New York. Um, this is what the fix that they tried to come up with uh, when they worked on, when West Virginia's Geological and Economic Survey started working on it. They kept the name of the Catskill, and they tried to correlate all of our rock layers as best they could with the rock layers in New York. And most of these we still use today. Um, 
from the 1950s onward. Uh, one thing that's a little bit awkward is the Portage group, when they remapped it, it they pretty much didn't go back out and try to further separate it. They just said, well, it's the Brailler Formation and Harold Shale, and we can't differentiate it. And that comes up later in our presentation. Uh, there's some really great work that was done by a UNC geologist named John Dennison, who is actually a West Virginia native boy and uh, came from Mineral County. And he's actually a graduate of Potomac State College in the 1950s. It's actually kind of funny. One of the librarians who retired, uh, he dated her mother briefly. So they've actually done, a, they did a lot of great work trying to understand how the Catskill or what they went back to calling the Hampshire group was related to other parts of the Eastern Seaboard. And they split up the Chemung uh, into the Sharon Four Knobs. Now we're going to be pretty much focusing on talking about the marine facies. So we aren't going to go too deeply into the upper Chemung or the Hampshire today. So we're talking mostly about this lower stuff. All right. And so again, this is what the most recent strat column tends to look like. Um, I can tell you as someone who's gone out and walked the beds in Mineral County and our adjoining counties, uh, this Tioga uh, ash bed is really hard to find. I think a lot of it is that where it is present, it has gotten washed out. Um, and a lot of this is there's uh, fa or facies differ uh, differentiations. For example, the Greenland Gap group is actually a lateral equivalent to the Hampshire group. The Hampshire is the more um, fluvial. It, it, as you start to go westward in our state, out towards uh, Elkins and Davis, you'll start to see this. And that's where we find things like Calamites, etc. Um, and actually, parts of the four knobs do show plant material, but we're not going to talk too much about that today. All right. And as I mentioned, um, when they said of low economic value, I actually pulled this straight from the county report. I'm not going to like read these off, but as you can basically say, see, they pretty much widely dismissed the entire Middle and Upper Devonian uh, as being of little to no interest, which is why they basically didn't go back in and try to remap. They did very little to try to actually clarify anything. And it's kind of left us with the problem we have today now as paleontologists going back through and trying to understand this. All right. And so where that gets frustrating, so for someone like me, who's lived in the area for a while, it's not that bad. But when we have someone come from the outside and try to get into it, uh, it becomes a real head scratcher. And often you have to kind of reshape things. Is that right, Nate? That is very much correct. Uh, I mean, we're going on old information. and We got to sit there and update it. Yeah. And how many times, like, when we're out in the fields, like, where are we? I don't know. And that has happened in several of our sites. Yeah. Um, so to start this off, uh, part of the problem is the bottom of the Devonian. We're not going to wax too much about this problem, but historically, the bottom of the Devonian has been hotly debated, whether it goes all the way up to the Ariscone sandstone or it's much lower in. And this is actually our very own date is next to the part of the Tenola Way. So when you're really down in the Tenola Way, it's easy to tell that it's the Tenola Way because it's very dolomitic. But the uppermost Tenola Way grades very gradually into the lowest Helderberg, and it's hard to tell them apart. Uh, and so one thing that has helped make this a lot easier is over the past decade, the US-48 construction pro uh, project has created new opportunities for exploration. So this is the 93 South Connector. And this is actually a site now that Nate and I love going to. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll point out at the top, and then Nate, I'll let you take the bottom. Uh, the, the top is actually the transition from the Silurian to the Devonian. But it's extremely hard to tell where it's happening. And it's so short of a distance that we can't even really easily differentiate the different shale and limestone layers. Um, it's an ongoing project we'd like to work on. But at this time, it's kind of incomprehensible. Yeah, and it, it's a really great little site. Uh, so the road right here leads to the the main highway, but as you're going through, you can actually see about three, four, maybe we sometimes argue that there's a fifth transition going on, and you can find lots of cool things such as different types of brachiopods, 
uh, crinoidal hash that is at least maybe two th feet in thickness at its densest, uh, to the point where you, when you take your rock hammer to work away at it, your rock hammer bounces off. It's it's a fascinating little sight, and it's yeah. so close to both of our houses. Yeah, we don't really want to give away where we live, but uh, this is within 15 minutes of us, so... Uh, these are some cool examples of what we found here. Uh, I'm going to actually, Nate's going to, the, the next slide, I'll show off his really cool thing. But uh, from the upper right, or sorry, from the upper left over, we have some coral material, some fenestra bryozoans in the middle, a really well-preserved uh, crinoid arm with all those pinnules. The one that's underneath of it, all the arms are closed in on themselves. So that's another little crinoid head. Some of these stalks are really thick. I wish I'd had something for scale in that picture. But uh, every one of those stalks is actually bigger than my th is thicker than my thumb. And very rarely at these sites, this is an example. The at the leftmost bottom corner, that's actually part of a orthoconic nautiloid shell. Uh, we don't see too many of those out here, so it looks like this is kind of a parts of the site look like they're a little bit of a settled um, car uh, deep carbonate. And other parts, like he, uh, Nate mentioned, look like they're a storm deposit along a reef where we get like the really thick crinoid hashes. But I think our pride and joy from this area um, is something that I thought I saw it and I thought that can't be it and kept walking. And Nate went back and took a second look. And you want to tell him what that is? Yeah, I took a second look and this was towards the end of the day. So we were getting ready to pack up our vehicles and head uh, back but there you go there is a crinoid head that has actually been expanded outwards so a little bit of prep and that will come out looking very nice yeah we're, we're finding so much stuff that we we really have to set aside more time to go back and prep over some of these things and this is a site we'd like to revisit but as we're going to talk about a little bit later some of our other sites have a little bit more pressure on them so we're going to have to spend more time there before we can come back to these. Uh, and if you're ever looking for a good day trip, Corridor H is a fantastic place to travel on, though. You'll, you go through millions and millions of years. You pretty much cross the entire Paleozoic on it. Hey, uh, so a, there was a, a question. Uh, what is a, there's a question from the, from the group. What is a crinoid? You keep saying that. People want to know what that is. So a crinoid is a type of invertebrate it is in the group that uh, called Echodermata, so it belongs closely related to your sea urchins, starfish. But uh, the most modern analog or the most closely it matches up to are like your sea anemones and your sea lilies. Uh, yeah, it's sea just a sensile feeder. Um, but yeah, this, this site is actually pretty cool just because it's just, you're, you will, will go into these pockets where there's the fossils found very close to what I actually take a lot of the photos of would be the structure of the site. I actually take a lot of photos of this site and use it for my uh, geology class. Yep. Sorry, I thought we had a picture of that real quick, but I, th I think that we accidentally removed it because we had so many That slides. would be the calyx. Yeah. Um, all right. So from there, once you get out of your limestones where things are a little bit murky, you get what I consider the, like, if you had to press me to say where does does it really kick off and start into the Devonian, it's in the upper lower Devonian with the Oriskany sandstone. And this is actually one of the really economically important areas. Um, and that's part of why we actually know so much about its distribution and its thickness, et cetera. And just like the Helderberg, which has been important for mining limestone, you know, these are the only parts of the Devonian that are well mapped and well understood in our area. And one thing that's kind of nice is because of how the underlying geology played out, the south branch of the Potomac has actually cut a path out through the Oriskany sandstone. And so if you go down to Romney and get on US 50, it's a really nice float trip, very nice and smooth. Uh, and actually, as you drive through Romney, uh, once you start to get into the western side away from um, I'll tell you right now, if you go to Lost Mountain Barbecue, I'm, I'm not being paid by the West Virginia Tourism Office, I swear. But if you go to Lost Mountain Barbecue, it's one of my favorite places to go until they put new mulch down. 
because I could easily find examples of cephalopods and really pretty brachiopods, etc., and their Montago exposures, and that's kind of the upper middle Devonian. But as you go westward through the town, you'll see up along the sides um, these sandstone outcroppings. Now, this picture is from the 1940s, and plant growth has really started to overtake it, especially on the right where you see, I believe it's called Indian Head Cemetery. Um, but as you go out of the town, and you can see it kind of off in the distance there, you will be able to see the really nice exposures of the Arisne sandstone there. Unfortunately, now with how things have eroded over time, there's a gully that's about uh, 10 feet or so down between the road and there. So I've never been able to actually travel over to look at it. It's kind of unfortunate. Now, by contrast, here in Kaiser, we're actually really well known for this uh, um, very compact, solidified uh, sandstone outcropping. It's a little bit of chert in there, too, uh, called Queens Point. And it's actually in McCool, Maryland, and overlooks the town. But if you look at the bottom of the postcard, you see the sandstone outcropping underneath of it. And if you're standing on Queens Point and you look across the Potomac River back into Kaiser, you'll see these giant walls of sandstone that are there. And these are unfortunately both on private property. Uh, I've had the opportunity to collect one five gallon bucket of material from there. And when we've actually like sifted through that, that loose material, um, I think I've collected like over 70 atripid brachiopods out of it. Um, the material is calcified, so you cannot use um, acetic acid to break it down. You can only gently wash it and try to pick them out. Um, and if you go kind of the lower parts of the section, as you get close to the Helderberg, the Ariscony tends to solidify a lot more and you get a lot more of the impressions and stuff like that that you're seeing on the, the right. Um, you get a lot of crinoid stalks and um, platyserrated snails are very common. Those were ones that preyed on that. Um, Nate and I together have not spent much time out here because honestly, it's everything that you would expect of an Ariscony formation equivalent uh it's it's so it's kind of a boring place to be all right and so i'm going to try to speed through these parts so that we can get to the cool stuff that nate wants to talk will want to talk about um those of you some people mentioned about being out in lost river i'm going to tell you the truth when you go out to that lost river trilobite site that uh is on fossil guys website that's actually you're really in, almost in wardensville um it's only called that because of the adjacent. There's a town called Lost River, and it gets confusing because part of the Kakapin River um, gets called Lost River as you cut through there. This site's pretty tapped out. Uh, it is nice because it shows some of the extreme folding that happens. And this really badly preserved uh, trilobite back is the only trilobite material I've ever found there. Our friend Max came out and picked up trilobites like crazy that day. Uh, before um, you guys go on, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the slide before this one, someone asked what was on the left. This one? Uh, no, the next one. That this one. one. Okay, on the left, uh, these are our two buckets of sediment that we were that I was washing the Ariscony material that I collected from right over here in. And so you ha you can see the bottom valves of a bunch of atripids, and these are the atripids that are from the other side. Um, I, I've got like 70 plus of these things. I, I like to give them away to kids. Yeah, and, and they're brachiopods, so uh, yeah. clams. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so no one's confused. This uh, vertebrate bone right here, that's just some deer, uh, piece of a roadkill deer I picked up. So it was laying in the ditch, and I thought, I'm going to grab that. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, now, Mason knows that we're cheating on this slide a little bit. Uh, this is some more of the Marcellus through Hamilton layer formations. Um, if you look right here, this is from the Montango. It's a nice little bit of a rugose coral. This really nice um, crinoid actually came from a quarry near Fort Frederick that's in Jasper Burns' site. Uh, I have spent a lot of time going through the Marcellus and even dragged Nate through parts of it, and we almost never find any fossils there. Um, Nate and I together need to get out to the Montago more. We've spent a lot more time in sort of what I call the interesting areas. But just by on a chance, I stopped at a site this past weekend. So we're always collecting new material. 
we actually found a little bit of a nautiloid on the, and also a straight-tailed uh, nautiloid as well. So we found a little bit of a coiled one in the app, so. All right, so that takes us to kind of our bigger next problem. And we mentioned that the Brailler uh, Harrell Shale is not well differentiated in our area. And typically when you get to, if you can find a part of the Harrell Shale, or sorry, of the Brailler that is well exposed um, and actually thick enough, it tends to become very dove colored, very light buff and brown. Uh, and you can see the whole issue with folding again, where it's kind of running the one direction, then wicks a really quick sharp turn and starts to curve into this little L shape. Uh, when we do find stuff here, it tends to be very poorly preserved, like these straight-shelled nautiloids, these bracts you can barely see. Um, but one day we were out actually at a craft show, and, oh, sorry, and this is one, another, uh, this is the best fossil I have found in, in the other parts of the um, Brailler Harrell shells that we've looked at. So it's it looks like it might be goniotides, but... Otherwise, this is as about as good as it gets, and the little bucalino that's next to it. Um, so that takes us to Nate and his really good luck. Okay, so this site, I am very, very happy that we wandered into it. Uh, this is actually part of the Upper Devonian. We think it's Brailler. We think it's Harold. Uh, just because of all the big questions we have about the stratigraphy and, ge and general geology of our region. Uh, this site is close to the uh, local airport and it's event we're eventually going to be losing this uh, site in February 2020, but it's such a cool site because not only do you have really cool structure, uh, such as the, some of these folds and cone and cone, um, but you get some nice exposures of the transition between the two uh, geologic units. Uh, there's a picture of me pointing out to where uh, our uh, next slide will actually be. And uh, just lots of cool things that we'll show you in this presentation. Yeah, on, on this slide, it's kind of nice. We've got um, examples of sort of, as well, there's a little bit of uh, fluting that goes on. I wish we had a picture of the nice as you start to go up into the part that we think is the Harrell Shale. Um, and it's so difficult because if you read the literature, basically all of these areas, the lowest Chemung into the uppermost um, Harrell Shale or Portage Group, depending on what you look at, grades very gently over. Um, part of what we plan to do is eventually go out to some of the better understood outcroppings in Pennsylvania. They're only a couple counties over from us and help distinguish this stuff a little bit better. If, if it will help, we're not really sure. This, this is such an odd site and it's unfortunate that we have such a limited amount of time to work in it. Nate's actually standing next to one of the only few surviving sections. It was basically a quarry that was used to, um, it was quarried for uh, paving and backfill. So a lot of the material is all tossed around. We think there could be some of the lowest Chemung. It may even cut, we can see that there's evidence that it, it's cutting into the bottom of the Montongo, which is the uppermost uh, Middle Devonian. So it's a really messy site. Um, so this is actually what really drew our attention to, to reach out and get permission to work the site private, the because it is private property. It's fenced in, so people cannot just walk into it. And Nate, you want to tell them about this thing? Okay, so we are working in a marine setting. But what you see on that rock right there is plant material. How on earth did that get there? And that's what we're trying to figure out, because that actually... Uh, shows about how close we were to the uh, shoreline and it's a wonderful example um, that we actually were able to excavate it uh nick how long did you think that it took us to excavate that um i yeah it, it, we did it probably in the court really when it was all said and done probably about five hours of labor and that was mostly the shales here are so brittle and they tend to crack really irregularly 
So we spent a lot of time trying to table underneath of it so we could just lift it up and flip it. Uh, unfortunately, what sucked for us is it still broke. Um, the irregularity of these shale layers and how fragile some of them are is, is a real challenge. And what's really cool about this one is that most of the plant material you see in these units um, are typically not longer than a thumbnail. They're like these really tiny little plant chits. And if you're not, uh, and that's with a C, no, but, but to be clear, uh, so if you're not used to seeing them, you might miss them and think that you're just seeing like some rock stuff. But if you get a little hand lens out, you can see the clear woody texture. This piece is um, actually more than eight inches long. So it's a really notable piece of driftwood that's out here in the site. And we think it corresponds to um, a, a lepid, uh, a lepid uh, sorry. Nate, you want to? Lepidididron. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, this is the one that Nate's really excited about. This is the one yeah. you found out there. So I decided to go, um, me and Nick, we were out hiking around this locality. I decided to split off, and I go up and over the ridge. And I'm like, okay, there's more rocks. There's more rocks. There's nothing really showing up that's interesting. And then I see this squiggle line, which you see on the bottom left. And then I get closer to it. And what you're looking at is just one part of a much larger slab. There's actually a picture of me to scale. And what I'm doing is I'm actually gritting this out, but the whole front slab that I'm looking uh, working on is loaded with trace fossils. And trace fossils are very cool because it tells us where that rock came from as it was deposited in relation to the shoreline. And so this whole front plate is loaded with, I count at least maybe six, seven, even eight different types of trace fossils from different invertebrates that made their home along this coast, such as in the upper right, the trace fossil called Ericolides, uh, the big long trace fossil that struck my attention it might be something called Protovigulera, which is, might be uh, the trace fossils of a cephalopod as it's trying to work its way through sediment looking for food. And then on the far right is a uh, flute cast of another trace fossil that we have no idea who that trace maker was. And this is an impressive slab. It's about a meter across, maybe a little bit more, at least 10 centimeters of extremely compact and thick irregular shale. It's so compact. Uh, Nick, how many battery packs do you think we burnt through with an angle grinder trying to work yeah, it out? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll kind of jump in from here. So our, our, our rock hammers actually like bounce off this stuff. So one of the things that sucks about being at a little school is we're totally funded out of pocket on this. So the tools that we have and the toys that we get to come out to the field with are what we've bought over time. So I've got a big fat boy chisel that usually makes short work of stuff. And it just bounces off this stuff. If I try to crack towards an edge, it breaks it regularly. So we called in the help of a buddy of ours, Dale Holland, who is a former um, Army specialist, uh, did some stuff with demolition. And so he has a lot of experience uh, setting up and breaking down concrete and other masonry. So he lent us the first day. He was like, yeah, you can come borrow some stuff. So we borrowed an angle grinder and we were able to cut a couple channels with the hope of trying to get in here. And we blew through two batteries in probably maybe eight minutes tops. Yep. And so he came back out and he's kind of given us a plan for working through this. So we've been trying to like quarry it out in small blocks while trying to not disrupt the face of the fossil. Yeah, it's we heavy. figured we could get yeah, uh, and we can we figure we can probably get maybe um, I want to say about fifteen smaller blocks, which will be easier to carry back to the field vehicles. And then uh, when I get all the pieces, I will be preparing them and starting the documentation process on this. But this is a wonderful, good teaching example to show how do you determine where you are located using the geology to say a coastline based upon the traces of animals left behind. 
Yeah, and I, I meant to point that out, but that is our buddy Dale in the middle there uh, taking, a, uh, taking a swing and a turn on trying to get this thing broken out for us. So, all right. So there's a lot of cool other stuff here. Um, there's, as I mentioned, a lot of what points to me, or a lot of what points to me that there are different um, possibly formations present is the preservation is very variable. We see some stuff that's almost piratized, that it like crumbles and falls apart if you even try to collect it. And that seems to mostly be corals and crinoids, and they seem to be in a different area. You see some jet black silicified material, and that tends to not be easily extractable from the matrix. And all of these things seem to co-occur on the same bedding planes, um, preservationally. Whereas now what's really fun is similar to the silica shale of Ohio, we will periodically find, like you see in this lower uh, left-hand corner, brachiopods that are silicified. They're kind of a gray crustiness, and they very easily pop out. They're very super well-preserved. So not only do you get the replaced uh, cast of the fossil, but if you can collect the bedding layer bit above it and below it, you get the top and bottom molds as well. So you can get a really nice detailed um, cast with a minimal loss of material and then the full molds for both sides. So it's really neat. Um, the other thing we're really excited about, and I gotta, I gotta be straight up with you people, um, I have not had the luck yet to find a trilobite here with the exception of one very large impression which I don't have a picture of because it is not one of these examples. It appears to be a large phacopid with, that is, does have eyes. But our buddy Dale, who if um, this ends up being a new species, possibly of Trimerocephalus, we are going to plan to name uh, it after him. And as well, Nate have been lucky enough to find a handful of examples of trilobites in this site. Now, I've been back through the literature at the, for this site and also for the uh, Brailler Harrell scale description for Pennsylvania. And the, none of these sites mention finding trilobites or in any of the equivalent layers. So it's really interesting. But you, I don't know how well you all can see this, but these trilobites do not have eyes. They appear to be blind. And so what we need to do is, right now we actually have, I think, about four to five specimens and we need to find a handful more so that we know that these are not just a few off individuals because one of the things that we've had the good fortune of learning as we've been reading more for this project is phacopids in certain deep water environments sometimes lose vision. Uh, so we wanna find a lot more to be sure that like this is not just a couple individuals that have gone quirky versus wow, this is actually something that's unique. So, all right. And again, like I said, I can't take credit for finding these. Our buddy Dale did. And then last, shoot, what were we out? Saturday or Sunday? Uh, last Sunday. Yeah. Nate just like, you know, and he's just up there. He's up on top of the He's like, I've got a trilobite. And I'm like, oh, you jerk. So I just can't, <laughs> I have no luck finding trilobites. All right. Nate, you want to share, share about these fun guys? Yeah, so also at this site, we have cephalopods, um, straight-shelled ones to be exact. Uh, these most likely match up to the orthoconic, uh, which <coughs> you've seen um, in just about every fossil show as orthoceras, but uh, these are not orthoceras. These are ones we're trying to figure out what they are, but we can actually find uh, small flecks of their shell on some of the denser uh, pieces of shale, uh, you can get complete uh, shells. And then right here on the right side is actually the largest one that we've acquired uh, so far. In fact, it sits over on my table right over there as I have to constantly drip uh, consolidant onto it. I've actually started today at about nine o'clock dripping consolidant onto it because the shale is so crumbly but yet I'm trying to preserve this wonderful uh, orthoconic cephalopod. Um, it, it's rather large, and we're still trying to find one about this size. So this is essentially the Andre, uh, the giant of cephalopods in our little field site. 
Yeah, th this site is not like what we see up in the Ordovician or other places where if you guys have ever had the good fortune to go to Cincy and you get those big old Fragma cones that, you know, make you feel like you're holding a Kielbasa or something. Or sorry, the Fragma cone is the living chamber. Like, those guys are monsters. Uh, cephalopods in this area tend to be little. And what Nate has is probably one of the biggest ones. And it's also probably why we are going to change what we do conservation-wise and probably try to apply consolidant like in the field. Um, him finding this, I, I just thought about this while we were looking at it, probably explains why the, we usually find a lot of cephalopod uh, impressions, but they're not very like well-preserved. And so I'm thinking now that what's happening is the silicified ones are flaking and crumbling away and they're leaving the impression underneath that we keep like stumbling across. And also, there are there is also a trace fossil that almost looks like an orthoconic cephalopod that's been just split in half. So that yeah. also throws us off. Yeah, we're going to have to find one of these that is in good enough shape that we can lock down in resin and just carefully start grinding away at. Um, one of the things that we've been told, we've actually reached out to Christian Klug for help on this is that the siphuncle and internal anatomy is what's going to help us clarify what species these belong to. Uh, the siphuncle is... Nate, can you explain the siphuncle in, in, in easy terms? I accidentally said that in front of a group of kindergartners last night and was Oof. like, oh, crap. Why did I say that? Um, so I think the best way to think about a siphuncle is kind of like a... It's a, it's a chamber for gases. Kind of helps with floating with these things. Yeah. And so they're distinctive in the different species and genera. Uh, genera. So we're going to have to try to like find an example that's good enough in cross-section that we can grind it and get some details on it. And so far, most of them are very flat roadkilly ones. So. Uh, Bronwyn asked what consolidant is for all those people. Oh, sorry. So the consultant I'm using right now is a Pilio Bond product uh, th that is not product placement, but you can buy a wonderful starter kit from them. But it is a mixture of um, chemicals. It's like a almost like a watered down super glue that's safe to put on your fossils, and it's there to make the grains a little bit more tacky to stick together and and hold together. And yeah. I've actually got a little custom drip set where it just every little every few seconds it drop drips a drop from the bottle into and it's supposed to permeate through the entire rock and then keep everything together for long term storage. Yeah, it, it's basically a mix up of a cyanoacrylic, um, like Nate said, like a super glue. And it's preferable to use because it is reversible. Uh, and you can control, like, so that's one of the issues in conservation is can you get something broken apart after you've glued it together if you need to? Um, so we tend to use, we're, we're kind of cheap out here. Like, sometimes we've had to share stuff up with Mod Podge and Hairspray, which, again, those are just cyanoacrylics. They work, and depending on the importance of the fossil, that they're useful for, like, really quick securing it up in the field. Yeah, for an example, uh, we've had bad storms come through our area, and so before the storms hit, I run out to where that trace fossil is, and I give it a nice little coat of the Mod Podge so we can weather that storm, so we can collect it at a later date. Yeah, and, and that's we also did that for the the trace, uh, or sorry, for the plant fossil, because we wanted to make sure that it didn't just like wash out and get completely eroded while we were gone. Um, we're not so worried about using it because we know that both of these things are reversible. Um, and in fact, that they're reversible, like really gently with water. So we feel pretty comfortable using them. Um, all right, so that takes us actually to a site that we came across before the airport. And it's in the, um, we, we originally thought this might be in the Brailler Harrell Shale, but because of the presence of this uh, sort of spirifer here, uh, that's a type of brachiopod, we're starting to think that it ha that it needs to be the lowest Shemung. Unfortunately, I found a reference today as I was crawling back through the literature, and apparently some of these species do extend down into the Harrell Shale. And so, again, it's just a case of everything is so unclear in what's been done in the past, and because it's not an economically important site, or sorry, air region, 
for um, mineral extraction, it's just not been clarified much. Um, Nate, do you want to explain what else is in this picture? Uh, so besides the brachiopod, in the bottom right is what I found on the outcrop, but it's a coral, and the coral was actually cut into cross sections, so you can actually see all the individual pieces of the anatomy, but then it was replaced with silica, so it makes it even much more visually uh, stunning and much easier to work with when you're trying to identify, because in corals, sometimes you have to identify it by the cross-section pattern. Uh, and it's completely, based on this picture right here, completely replaced all the way through. Yeah. Now, Nate has another name that he likes for this site, and that is... And I call this the Big Brack site because I like Big Bracks, and I cannot lie. Yeah, the uh, that's the exact same specimen that's in the previous picture, except he's holding it so you can get a sense of how big these are. They're actually probably in the upper 10% range for the entire phylum of brachiopods. These things are ridiculously big. Um, they're not the biggest, but they are pretty big. I, I have never seen brachiopods as large as this, this out here. Yeah, this site actually got me to like brachiopods. And if anybody has taken an undergrad paleontology class, you know, your first opening assignment is trying to figure out brachiopods, and that is a mind numbing assignment sometimes. So. Yeah, the, the closest I've seen to this is there are some strophaminids um, in the earlier rocks that kind of get this big, but they're not, you, anyone who's ever seen a strophaminid brachiopod, they're not super 3D ish like these are. These are really cool. All right, so I know we don't have a lot of time, so we'll try to wrap this up. This site, we just wanted to put a slide here so you can see how it relates to the other one. Um, so we think that as it's sloping off, we're getting this younger site that's showing up down here, sort of downhill from the airport. Whereas you can see the private property the airport owns in the upper part of the slide over there that's a little bit higher. So even though it's higher, it's actually older, not younger, because of the slope of the region. And usually I'm the picture taker, not the in the picture, but thankfully we finally found one where I'm actually there like pointing at something and I'm pointing to the layer where the brachiopods are coming out from here. All right, so that kind of takes us to the future of this site. Um, the big thing right now is we're gonna go race against time to collect as much material as we can because we're going to lose this site. And one of the things we have to balance is because this is private property uh, and the airport has a little gallery museum, we have to balance like what material we collect to go to actual museums like research institutions, but also be setting aside things that could be used for a small display for the gallery that's there. Um, and of course, we're also interested in continuing to explore the Paleozoic rocks of our area, uh, and particularly the stuff that is much younger than this site and much older. And Nate's working on some really cool stuff too, of course. Yeah, uh, I'm working on a, a variety of different uh, projects. Uh, some of those uh, include such as uh, exploratory searches for fossil exposures using geographic information systems. Uh, that's actually part of my uh, geography background. Um, as Nick said earlier in the report, I do work on mosasaurs. So I actually have two mosasaurs uh, paper uh, Get, one is getting ready to come out, so hopefully I can come back to the club and talk to you all more about it. And uh, other Mesozoic-related projects, and even some recent Cenozoic, but, um, you know, keeps you busy. Yeah, I, I was actually fortunate enough uh, working with another friend of ours. We have a paper out in Marine and Fishery Sciences on Mississippi River bull sharks. So it's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, we just want to say thank you so much. We're happy to take whatever questions you have. But for sorry, thank you for having us here. The one thing we would like to make sure that we thank more than anything else is our partners, parents, and puppers who have the most patience with us in the world as we travel about out of the home and come back with pockets full of rocks. And let's not undersell this. Typically, it is a bag full of rocks, not just pockets. Thank you to Mason the Club for letting us be part of your speaker series. 
and also to Potomac State for gainful employment when we are not off doing things that we enjoy in our spare time. Thank you so much, guys. That was awesome. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, seeing all your fossils from around the state. Uh, we have a, a ton of questions, uh, and please, guys, keep putting in questions if you have them. Um, first of all, we have someone asking, uh, why are we losing that uh, the site? Are they building something there, or uh, what's happening there? Yes. Um, so the site originally was a quarry for um, backfill and paving rock. Uh, but the airport is planning expansion. Our regional little regional airport is growing and they need to put in a new runway. So they are planning to demolish and flatten out that area. All right. And uh, this is a question. And that was a question from uh, Barrett. And I had a question early in the talk. You guys mentioned an ash bed. Was there a volcanic eruption and did it create any changes in what lived there? So, Nate, you might be able to jump in here. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that the Tioga Asheville um, layers are a well-known layer across the eastern seaboard. I don't remember if that was an impact or volcanic. Nate, do you know? So there's actually been a couple theories, but it seems like it's leaning towards some of the early volcanism that helped shape our region in the Appalachians. It's, uh, it, it helped uh, lay that wonderful ash layer outwards. Cool. Uh, Kim asked, uh, and, and Nick kind of started to answer it, is the Helderberg formation related to the Helderberg escarpment in New York by Albany? Yes, absolutely. And what's kind of cool is uh, if you all ever visit Kaiser, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to say this, this offer is open. Uh, I'm happy to like show you around some of those cool things. We actually have the type section of the Kaiser limestone of the Helderberg group. It is actually named for Kaiser, West Virginia. So we have a really... Um, neat little like it's a it's a wonderful exposure i think i think the wall is like 80 foot or, or taller very cool uh and and i had another question uh because i I'm, i always come up with a ton of questions uh would those large cephalopods that you showed earlier those large shelled squids would they be the apex and uh, predators in their environment or was there something else that was eating everything so that's a great question um the there's a lot there's it's kind of commonly assumed that all cephalopods must be like the big nectonic predators uh we haven't found anything larger that would prey on them out here but because the site's so broken up i mean i always wonder if we could find something else that might be a potential this this layer is potentially uh, oh someone just said it in, in chat but i was gonna say this layer is actually potentially um, a, a lateral equivalent to like the Bedford Shale in Ohio. So we always have to wonder like, is there placoderm material out there that we're not finding? And, and placoderm, you go. <laughs> you know, and again, if, if I can pin, pinpoint more on the trace fossils, these could have just been cephalopods that might've just wandered into a low stand and then died, who knows? Yeah, and uh, George Spica is our curator of paleontology, and placoderm fish are armored fish, which we had in this time, which is really cool. Uh, Dave Scott asks, uh, do you need volunteers to help collect material uh, from sites, from the airport site specifically before it's lost? And I think we should go along with that. If you uh, find something you think might be scientifically significant uh, from West Virginia, who do you go about talking to, you know? Um, Okay, so that, that is tricky. Uh, Nate and I would need to think about that. Um, part of the problem is, so we only have permission right now for Nate and I to be there. It is a former quarry site. So it's a little bit of, I mean, it's nothing really too odd, I think, for most people who go hunting fossils. Um, but we'll need to, we need to think about that for bringing other people in. We've only thought about bringing some people that we have worked in the field with before. Um, and Nate, I mean, do you have any other thoughts on that? Um, we would have to do some thinking about that. Uh, I always do like to have more hands, but we need to figure out a, 
a, a plan for something like that. Um, and we would have to clear it with the uh, the property owners because it is private property. Um, that's true. Uh, so the question about if you find a fossil, honestly, I, I, I know we're recorded, so I don't want to say anything too out there, but the infrastructure within West Virginia is not fantastic for uh, supporting and cultivating and nurturing paleontology. Um, I don't want to say that we're the best people to talk to, but I honestly feel like if you find a cool fossil in West Virginia, probably let Nate know. Uh, if you're in southern West Virginia, though, maybe Ron Martino at Marshall University would be the first person I would think about because they have probably one of the only geological museums in the state, even though it's a it's not a public collection, but they have pretty much one of the only ones that really is there. Nate, would you, I mean, would you say you're probably the, one of the best people to talk to in the northern in the northern part? For the northern part, yes, I I would uh, say that I'm it. Um, where you can just send me a picture um, on the very first slide is my work email, and I will get back to you. Um, I'm and I'm always interested in seeing what people collect. So yeah. if you if you collected something from say the Mesozoic and outside of the state, I'd be interested in taking a look. Yeah, I, I think that what has been unfortunate for West Virginia Paleo is even though you know WVU is an R one institution, they're a big dog. Um, typically, a lot of the researchers who are there are not interested in West Virginia Paleo. They have wonderful sites that they're exploring, whether it's you know, beautiful logger shots in Morocco or in, uh, you know, places like Wisconsin, Michigan, et cetera, for what they work on. And they kind of forget about little West, you know, that the state that they're in has a wonderful and rich fossil history of its own. Um, sometimes you see it like a lot of the master's theses that are produced by that program. It's, it's kind of like they cut their chops doing some strat correlation and stuff like that. We'd love to see more interest in, you know, local paleo. Uh, Barrett asks, when you lose a site, how how disappointing is that? Uh, can the same material be recovered elsewhere uh, in the same layers? Nate, you want to take that? Uh, sorry, you broke up on what was the question? Uh, when you lose a site, how disappointing is it? Can the same material be recovered from other sites? Um, so whenever we lose a field site, and this has actually happened to me uh, quite a few times, not just here in uh, West Virginia, but a lot of times in Texas, because I used to work in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, so I lost sites uh, almost on a monthly basis. But um, it's very disappointing. But if you can get, find exposures that are of the same age, you do you will get lucky, um, and hopefully that fauna uh, and all the fossils carry over. And sometimes you will actually find the pocket that no one else has looked at, and will find lots of cool things. So it's a trade-off. Yeah, right now we're in this with the airport site. It seems to be a rare area where the layers are thick enough to preserve a variety of fossils whereas most other layers that we have found that are the lateral equivalents to this are typically a fossiliferous or there's very few fossils there so it's going to suck when it's gone but on the other hand we've been really fortunate that they have permitted us to be on their private property and collect what we can um and so it's a balance of that. Like, you know, we don't want to be upholding regional development and, you know, trying to get the economy going in the area. But we do want to have, take the advantage of collecting as much scientific information as we can. And uh, Bronwyn asks, could paleontological tourism help revive local economies of small West Virginia towns? So could we turn paleontology into a, a boon for the economy to make those, you know, low value formations something that's actually useful? I don't know. I've thought about that. I, I threw that out there at one point and to our local tourism people, and they kind of threw it back at us. Well, 
you come up with a handful of low value sites that people could go to and we'll talk so that's that's the problem is finding a site that's you know kind of low value and having like a little road driving trip and the problem is those sites seem to be so far apart it's kind of tricky and I think historically, uh, we're so ingrained in coal and timber that it's hard to sell away from those two major exports. Exports that are uh, interacted with, um, and this is something I talk about in my geography class, on a global scale. Uh, so it, it's kind of in our DNA, and uh, trying to steer away from that is a little tough. So somebody asked, actually, I'll just jump in and go ahead and say, they say Wardensville is tapped out. I, I don't think it's tapped out, tapped out completely, but it, honestly, I, I've been there about four different times, and I have probably spent about four or so hours each time, and I don't know if I arrived after somebody else got there, like, within the same week, but I, I have not had much luck with it. Honestly, there are other sites that are in Jasper Burns' book. I think we talked about that in the... I don't think we talked about that during this session, but we talked about it in the pre-session um, chit-chatting. And honestly, if you're wondering about good places to look for in West Virginia, Jasper Burns' Fossil Hunting in the Mid-Atlantic States is an excellent book. At least 35% of the sites in it are West Virginia sites. So I love this book so much. And most of the sites hold up. But honestly, like I was saying about Wardensville, um, having been there and spent three, four-hour sessions, uh, I have never had much luck there. Now, I know I've had friends who have like gotten stuff there and, and done really well, but honestly, exploring the road outcrops that are nearby have been more productive for me. I will say we'll probably have a trip there some point with our club if we can. Um, I know I've been there once, and I did find a few broken trilobites. Uh, so there's there there can be stuff there, but there's I think a lot of stuff covering it. So uh, maybe we'll we'll give it a try someday, and everyone in the club can can figure it out for themselves if they like it. Yes, George mentioned you mentioned the crinoids at the uh, Burns's Big Spring site. Yeah, it's really interesting. Burns actually has a typo um, for Big Pool in Indian Springs, and that's actually where the the really pretty crinoid that I had for the Marcellus to Hamilton. Uh, series is from. Oh, I was going to say the other thing I think that's an issue with Wardensville is there's so much foot traffic on it that I think what you just pointed out, Mason, is absolutely right that the traffic that happens there leads to material falling and covering over. Uh, whereas it just, I think it depends on when you get there and how much effort you can put in to find something. Dave Scott asks if uh, you've searched the New River, West Virginia area. So I've actually, I, I hate to be the person to answer a question again. Um, I've actually been close to New River. I was in Cedar Grove in December. Part of the problem um, now with New River is that a lot of the areas that look potentially viable, including uh coal tail like tailing piles and former coal towns are now inside the inventory of the national park service and it is my understanding that the parts that the way that that site is classified and where some of these sites are that it is not where it's a you basically can't collect on it um where i was at in cedar grove it um i actually had a lot of luck i was following up on leads from the west virginia state museum um, but I know a lot of people have found stuff. It's typically in the Kanawha Formation aged. And if you go, I'm blanking on the name. I believe it's Fayetteville. I don't think that's right. But it's near New River. It's near the New River Gorge Bridge. Um, there are a couple of sites near one of the old schools there that apparently will produce for plants. Well... Uh, I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so glad we had you guys, and we'll definitely have you back at some point. And uh, we have Nathan back to talk about mosasaurs, those giant sea lizards, which are always super cool uh, when his paper comes out. Um, is there any last words you guys would like to get in before we close off for the night? I would say just get outside and look down. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like the quote we threw in here, the best geologist is the one who's seen the most rocks. And we would say there, there's nothing that beats time spent on the ground looking and in, in the field for real rocks. You know, we love museums and we think that collections are very important, but you never know what you can find just by getting outside. So go do it. Yep, this was a great uh, teaser for getting out there, and the Fossil Club has all kinds of opportunities to do just that. You can go out with a group of folks um, and learn a lot. So if you haven't signed up for a trip to Stratford Hall or the Beltsville trip, and stay tuned for some other field trip opportunities as uh, they get planned. If you um, are interested in being more involved with the Fossil Club, let us know in helping us plan and organize uh, different field trips. That would be great. Um, and also, don't forget Shark Fest coming up if you want to volunteer um, or donate some items uh, to help make Shark Fest bigger and better and than ever before. Um, thank you all for sharing your time. Thank you um, uh, to Nate and Nick for sharing your talents with us. It was wonderful and you, uh, we definitely want to have you back. Um, everybody stay well, uh, stay curious, and as everyone says, stay outside, even in the heat, but stay hydrated uh, when you're looking for rocks. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll see you later.